At this time, we will do our scripture reading, which comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen through eighteen. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so We believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that... We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is never a fun topic to tackle. I mean, who wants to talk about death? For some of us in this room, we are all too familiar with death. In fact, I think most of us, if not all of us, actually probably confidently say all of us, have experienced death in some way, shape, or form at least once throughout our lives. Being younger, I've certainly experienced it less, but I have my own stories. My wife has hers and you all have yours of someone that you love, someone that you miss, someone that you desperately wish you could see again can't. At least not yet. For me, it's my grandmother. She's the one that comes to mind when I want to talk about this. When I was in late middle school, early high school, my grandmother had a health crisis. I don't remember what it was. And her health declined rapidly. We thought we were going to lose her then. And For the next five years, she would recover from every health crisis, but never quite to the level she was before. So after her first one, she was like maybe 90%. And she had another crisis, then she was 80. Another crisis, 70. And we knew, we knew the time was coming that we would have to say goodbye. That her death was an unfortunate inevitability around the corner. So one day, as I'm working at Kmart, where I was employed as a high school student. I actually remember vividly, I was on my hands and knees scrubbing the bottoms of the racks where we hang the clothes because they were just dirty and gross. And my boss comes up to me and says, hey, you need to go home. Your grandmother is not doing well. They've called in hospice. So, oh, okay. Got my stuff. and took the 15-minute drive to my grandmother's house. When I got there, I was led into the room where my grandmother's bedroom was. She's laying in her bed. And I'm told she's not doing well. She's in and out of consciousness. She's struggling. I don't know this for sure, but I very likely could have been the last person who ever got to talk to her before she died. We said our goodbyes and a couple of last words. And I left. Went home. I was in high school. What was I going to do? Three days later, as I'm walking into the same store to work, I get the call that says that she passed away. So I walk through the front door to look at my boss, say, sorry, I gotta go. And I leave. Take a 15 minute drive to my grandmother's house. I don't know what to do. My parents eventually just tell me to go home. So I do. It didn't hit me until a week later exactly the, the tremendous loss that I had just suffered. I still remember to this day the memories of my grandmother. The, she used to have a different house where she had a, a built-in kind of the hillside pool. And I remember times where we would learn to swim. And we would, before I could really touch the bottom, I wasn't allowed to go in the middle, so I had to hold the railing and swim on the edge of the pool. And there was one time I'd gotten out and I was all bundled up in a towel, and my dad just grabs me and tosses me right back into the pool, towel and all. I was trying to get dry, Dad. 
And this was at my grandmother's house. And I remember I used to go to the elementary school that was right across the street from her. And sometimes I would just walk just 50 feet to my grandmother's front door where I'd walk in, we'd watch some movies. I remember Christmases at her house too were always way too extravagant. We had a table that was about that tall with a Christmas tree that was only that tall surrounded by presents piled taller than the Christmas tree for all of the kids, the grandkids of my grandmother. She went all out for Christmas. And every once in a while, I think of these stories and I just wonder what would life have been like if she could have seen me graduate college, even graduate high school? What if she saw me got married? What if she could have met her great-grandkids? I will never have the answers to those questions. In fact, neither one of my grandmothers got to meet my wife or my kids or see me graduate college. It just wasn't in the cards. So sometimes I wonder, in death, what is God doing for them? How is God taking care of them? How is God caring for even my family during this time? I'm not going to answer that second question. That second question is incredibly complicated, and it's very it varies from person to person. However, I hope to answer the first question today. I'm going to go through this verse by verse because I want to unpack what Paul is saying here in this passage because I want you to be encouraged in the loss of your loved ones, whomever they are and however long they've been gone. I hope Paul encourages you today. So I'm skipping the first part, but I'm going, to, I'm going to read the whole verse, but I only put on what I really want you to focus on. So this is verse 13 of chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And I wanted to put a note on here. Remember, the Thessalonian church... Whoops. I'm getting too excited and animated. Thank you so much, David. The Thessalonian church, yes, okay. The Thessalonian church was suffering persecution. Their loved ones did not simply pass away from old age or complications due to disease. Some of their loved ones were jailed, beaten mercilessly, thrown to the lions or the wild animals, stoned. These people were slaughtered in some cases. And Paul is writing to them as an additional note to say, listen, do not grieve as those who have no hope. This is the first important point that Paul wants to see, and I think this is a a verse that many of us are familiar with. I think so much so that some of us, and I've been guilty of this too, have taken this verse a little bit too far. This verse is not telling us that we should not grieve at all. I know so many Christians who feel like it is a sin or it is wrong to be upset over a loved one who has passed away, who is a Christian, who is in heaven. And if you or someone you know thinks like this, I would encourage you to just remember or remind them that is not the case. Jesus himself grieved over Lazarus, who he was literally about to raise from the dead. He grieved with Mary and Martha, who were so devastated by the fact that if Jesus had just been there, Lazarus would not have died. We would not have these mourners around here grieving with us. We wouldn't have sent for you if we had known you would have been late. But Jesus wept. He wept with them. He wept because of them. It is okay to be upset to grieve, to cry, to feel all of these deep emotions because emotions are something God gave to us. This is something I've tried to begin teaching my own son. Listen, anger is okay because God gave you anger. The trick you have to figure out, Judah, is how to be angry and not yell at me because that's where you cross a line from anger that's okay to anger that's not okay. And you're three. You're learning. Dad still hasn't figured this out, so it's okay. We're all on this journey together. But emotions, grief, sadness, loss, 
anger, frustration, all of these emotions that we feel at the loss and death of someone that we desperately love are normal. They're okay. Because death is not okay. Death is not something that we should experience. Death is a result and a consequence of sin. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope. What does Paul mean by that? I put the whole verse up here, but I'm going to break this in half. First part of this verse. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. But that's why we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus died and rose again. The foundational, fundamental, core aspect of our faith on our entire being that Jesus Christ died and rose again. In fact, Paul himself said, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, if he did not die and raise again, we above all humans, we above all men and women, are to be pitied the most. Our faith, our entire belief system is contingent on that fact. Jesus is still dead and buried. We are fools. We should not be here. But Jesus did in fact die and raise again, so we know that we have a hope. We have a resurrection. We have a future promise that is coming to us. We have a God who saw fit to rescue us from the depths of our own depravity and sin because he wanted to, because he loved us, because he just he just felt like it. What is the second part of that verse? And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So <clears throat> we grieve as those who have hope because we know Jesus was raised, was died and raised again from the dead. And as a result of that, we believe strongly that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now there's a couple of verses to define. I skipped over the first use of this, but what does fallen asleep mean? This is an idiom. It just simply means they died. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is livid with that church over how they're conducting the Lord's Supper. And he even says, some of you in your sin have fallen asleep. This is not a spiritual death. This is a physical death. God was punishing the 1 Corinthian church, the church in Corinth, for their grievous sin against the Lord's table. So, we know that fallen asleep means they died. That's what that term means. It's an idiom. It just means they died. But what do we specifically believe about those who have died? It's that Jesus will bring with him those who have died in him. So, if you are a Christian, what we believe is that at death, your body and your soul or your spirit, however you want to define that, separated, temporarily. The body is effectively asleep in the ground. Unfortunately, we experience decay. We experience rot. Everything breaks and falls apart. That all happens. But our spirit is sent off to, we don't know. There are a lot of theories. It's either hanging out with Jesus, if we're a Christian, or suffering, if we're not. It's either just in limbo, asleep in its own way, or it's in some nebulous ether of, we're not sure. We don't know specifically what happens immediately after death. We, we just don't know. But we are confident that our body and our soul are separated. And that is not good. You see, we as humans are meant to exist as humans. We know that part of the promise of the resurrection, which we'll get to in a moment is that our bodies will be raised up and glorified. God's intention, then, is to restore us to how we are now. Well, hopefully God will shave a couple pounds off of me. Maybe get my knee that's hurting today working a little bit better. Certainly, I believe, and many agree with me, that God will restore our bodies to an ideal state, whatever that looks like, whatever this glorified body is part of the package deal. But right now, 
those who have fallen asleep are separated from their bodies. They're in an unnatural state. Until Christ returns, they will remain in that unnatural state, whatever they're doing. So now I want to continue on to verses 15, 16, and 17. <clears throat> Verse 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that those who are, that you tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. This is what I really want you to hear today. We, if Christ came back right now, we would not be the first to greet him. Our loved ones would. My grandmother would. Your loved ones who died in Christ would be the first to greet him. The first to raise from the dead. Whatever their bones erupt out of the ground or they just materialize in front of Jesus. No idea. God not forgotten about your loved one. Whomever came to your mind, no matter how many of them they are, God has not forgotten about them. In fact, they're going to be the first priority in receiving the eternal blessing and the renewed body. If Christ came back right now, we would step aside, hopefully gladly, to say, Lord, please bring us back our loved ones. Let us See them. Let you see them first. We'll be right behind them. Verse 16 continues in in kind of an illustrative fashion where Paul says that this is all coming because the Lord is going to come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call, this big procession from heaven to announce the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. This is one of the passages that we, that uh, if, you, if, if you do the pre-mill stuff, if you're curious about that, this is one of the passages we get uh, the rapture from. However, I want to encourage you, this passage in particular, I would, I would encourage you to not look at it that way first. First, what I would encourage you to look at is it's a promise to those who have died, and it is a promise to those who are alive. So here in verse 16, we see this promise to those who are dead. They're going to be raised up. And verse 17 says, And then we who are still alive, so Jesus comes back right now. Our loved ones come first. Our bodies are restored. We are ascended to heaven. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will be with the Lord forever. Paul here is focused on the promise of eternal life forever. That's his focus right now. So the procession of the Lord is going to work like this, as far as what Paul is talking about here. First, the dead in Christ will be raised first. It's going to happen when Christ ascend, or descends from heaven with a trumpet call, the voice of the archangel, and a command for the dead to raise. The dead will then raise. They'll go up to heaven and be with Christ. And then we, whoever's alive, will then join them. We will be then with God forever. Whether that forever begins with a millennium reign or not is a different question. We will be with God forever. Have you ever pondered how our loved ones are doing? Where they're at and what they're, they're going through right now? I think about it a lot. I don't know why. It just comes to my mind. I think about death. I think about my death. What is it going to be like? See, I like living. I actually really like living. I like living a lot. I like seeing my kids and my wife and hearing her voice and and being able to play with them and, and watching their joy as they learn stuff. I don't want to lose that. But unless Christ comes, my death is inevitable. And every day, I take my long, tired, or maybe very quick march towards that end. So I have to trust in the promises of Jesus. My death is not going to be the end of me. 
ultimately the next step in the life that God has planned out. And that step, unfortunately, unless the Lord wills otherwise, will include my death and then my eventual resurrection. But I will see my loved ones again. All of them both of my grandmothers, some of my extended relatives that I didn't know very well, but I had a relationship with. I'll see them all again. And I'm sure right now you can all think of probably multiple people that you've lost over your lifetime that you would love nothing more than to see again. You will. If they died in Christ, you will. If their faith had been put in the Lord Jesus, you will see them. And we know this because Christ died and rose again from the dead. So Paul ends this whole passage with this. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is encouragement. Encourage one another with these words. This is the end. We have hope. Christ will not forget our loved ones. They will not be abandoned or left in the ground to rot forever. The time is coming maybe even very soon, where they will be born again, raised from the dead, allowed to live, to see us, to hug us, to touch us. Can you imagine that day? To touch your loved one again, to give them a hug, to hear their voice, to know that it will never happen again. But it's coming. I promise, because God has promised is coming. So, all we can do is encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with the hope of our future. Encourage one another with Christ's deep and compassionate and desperate love for us and for our loved ones. God is a God of infinite love and a God who keeps his promises is one of the things that makes him holy. One of the things that makes him so different. He will never turn his back on a promise. So we can have hope and trust in the Lord. We're going to wrap up in prayer here in just a moment, but before we do, I just want to point out, we are going to take communion here in a moment. And this communion celebrates the death of our Savior remembers the death of our Savior. And both of those are appropriate because Christ died for you and for me. There's a celebration there. But we should never forget, even while we take communion, even while we for a moment focus on his death, we can never forget that this is not the stopping point for his story. He is alive again. So we take this with the full hope and expectation that we will not stay this way as well. We will find renewed hope, a renewed sense of purpose in worshiping the Lord, in celebrating life, and living in a body that God has designed to last in eternity with Him forever. So let's pray to the Lord and ask Him for His encouragement. Father, we want to come to you this morning and just ask for that encouragement. We ask and pray that you would bless us today, that you would be with us, that you would encourage us, that you would comfort us. Lord, even in, in, in recalling my own grandmother earlier today, I, I felt the emotion of tears and sadness and sorrow, Lord. So I just ask to remind my heart that it was not the end. I will hear her voice again, that I will see her again. We will all see our loved ones again hear their jokes. We can tell them stories about what our lives were like after we lost them. We can catch them up on all the exciting and wonderful things that happened. And then we can look to the future together, the future you have promised us. So Lord, would you encourage us to grieve, but to grieve as those who have hope, desperate hope in you. Because you are with us. You've comforted us even when we walk in the deepest, darkest valley of suffering and death, you are with us. You have 
nothing to be afraid of. So Father, strengthen our hearts, encourage our hearts, help us to look forward to your promise being fulfilled. We might see them again. So Father, we ask for this comfort in your name, your son's name, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.